about some RESA efficiency methods. Um, first thing I wanted to say, this is the way that I do things. It's not to say that ways that other people do things are wrong. Um, this is how I do my things. Um, again, it's not, this isn't something that we need to debate that this is the way we need to do it here or this isn't. Um, um, so what I'll do um, a lot of the times, and this is just, again, just a quick example of a simple elevation. Here we have three different configurations um, of these frames. Uh, there's a cantilever at the bottom and intermediate anchor here. So I know that I'm going to need to model this in Risa. But again, I'm not going to model uh, uh, each elevation. Now, when you're going through PDFs and these elevations are split up over 100 pages, you have a big CAD file with all the elevations split up. What I like to do is just start grouping in AutoCAD, somehow grouping them together just to get an idea of what elevations line up. Um, so in this case, usually what I'll do is draw some simple lines, line up the elevations, make sure anchors line up, frame heights line up, and then based on this I can determine, all right, I need one recent model that can cover all these elevations. And this here, it's this is a pretty clear example. Um, you may not need to necessarily do that for simple elevations like this, but for bigger elevations, um, this is something that I always find, uh, find helpful. Uh, this will also, as I mentioned, reducing redundancies in your model and analysis so that you're not modeling a couple of the same things uh, twice. Um, second item, why did you model that entire elevation? Um, so, so basically we have, this is uh, two elevations that come together to 90 degree corner right here. Um, a lot of the times I'll see when reviewing projects, people will model all of these, uh, these verticals in here. Um, and basically what that's doing is to help bring down weak axis in-plane deflection of the corner. You don't necessarily have to model the entire elevation. Um, one thing you can do, let's say we, um, let's say we just modeled this small section. These end verticals, you can actually sum up the, the stiffness, your weak axis stiffness of the members. So if you have one, two, six, six members right here, this end mullion, you can increase the, the stiffness and the weak axis by six to account for the additional in-plane uh, stiffness that you're getting from these other, these other verticals. That way you don't have to go and model the entire elevation. Matt, will that, will that work if you don't have any horizontals? No, okay. it will not. <laughs> Good call. Yeah, if, if you don't have horizontals, now that's a case, if you don't have horizontals, I wouldn't even model this much. All I would do is just model these last two bays, because really all you're doing is looking for the analysis on the corner. Why won't it work if you don't have horizontals? Why won't it work if you don't have horizontals? Any of the new guys? So here we have at a 90 degree corner mullion, your elevations would frame into that. Now, if you have wind pressure blowing on this, on one face, what's gonna happen to the corner? It's gonna start deflecting basically in two directions like that. So you're getting some deflection in plane deflection along there. Now, what Stuart was saying, if you don't have if you don't have, or if you have another vertical over here, and you don't have a horizontal connecting these, is this vertical going to move? So here's your, your corner in question. Now you don't have any horizontals tying these two together. This adjacent vertical, see any in plane movement. So that's why in this case, if you had, if you got rid of all these horizontals, 
and this uh, your corners deflecting over our allowable in plane, you're not going to be able to model this in any way that these adjacent verticals are going to help out with that deflection since there's no horizontal to transfer that. That's kind of how I would take care of a situation like that. Um, again, it helps you cut down on time modeling this whole frame. Um, are you assuming that all of your verticals are the same part? Yes. Now, so, so oh, what do you do so if you have a bunch of SSG verticals but your jams are captured? And you need to look at the jam deflection and the, the yellow glazing pocket deflection. What do you do on situations so like that? So in cases like that, this will get a little more complicated. If the captured mullion is, has, uh, it is a stronger member, I would, if possible, just use the SSG and call it conservative. Because mm -hmm. you know if the SSG works, the captured works. Um, so yeah, there are, you can, we can throw in a million different little, little things like that. But yeah, that's something good to, uh, to know that when, when I'm adding the, uh, the weak axis values, actually, well, even if you have, I guess if you have SSG captured, SSG captured, you could still add up the stiffness. That's all you're, that's all you're mm -hmm. needing. So you're not actually doing an analysis on those other verticals. So the, the main thing is you that. need to make sure that when you're looking at the DLO deflection in the biaxial sheet that you're using the correct captured or yeah. or sealant SSG deflection methods. Yep. Yep. Um, okay, so that's a corner condition. Another item under why you model the entire elevation uh, because typical mullions fall in corner zones, but the jam doesn't. Um, so just because you have a situation like that um, doesn't necessarily mean that you have to model a corner wind pressure and a typical wind pressure. Um, here I'm gonna, here's kind of just a general example. Big old elevation. Um, on this side we're dead loading at the sill. Got an intermediate wind load, intermediate and a cantilever. Over here we have a step up where we're dead loading right here, intermediate and cantilever. What I guess what what part of this elevation would you guys model? How much of the elevation would you model? There are no corners on here, and the whole elevation's in a typical zone. A bundle stick. A single stick. Well, you need three for that step, right? Is there, is there a little step that goes up? Right here? Yeah. I try to model the three to the left of that step and the three to the right of that step, just so you have a good view of that middle one, and then you got a typical on each side and a jam on each side. So you want to do something like that. Yeah. Okay. So okay, explain why we would do we would just model this. So for me, the unique things you're checking are that far right one is kind of going to act like a jam, so you can check your sealants and stuff. The one right to the next of that. <coughs> it's checking a different span condition, but it's a typical vertical for that span condition. And then the next one over, um, you've got that step in there, so you've got a weird wind load condition, and you got to check where that detail is calling out to make sure the sealant will work down there. So you kind of got that in there. And then the next one over is another typical vertical with a different span condition. And then the next one over that is a jam with that span condition, so you can have the deflection for the sealant. So you kind of cover that whole, everything you need to check. Yep. You, even if that jam on the bigger model, can, can you go back to the big, bigger model? So if for some reason your jam on that bigger model, like the DLO on that jam is, is much bigger than your <laughs> typical DLO, I would model like Matt was saying, and just make that one opening the same size as that jam. That way you're covered. On that yeah, so, so that's something that I've done before. So you're talking about like on this, make it, actually making yeah. it a wider DLO than it actually is. To cover is. the jam. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I would say, yeah, that's great, as long as it doesn't negatively impact. Overload that. Oh, yeah, yeah, and that we need steel, because that's not an actual yeah. case. But yeah, if we increase that 
DLO that will cover our jam. We know that this works with the larger DLO, thus that vertical is fine. On the overloading, a quick thing, um, ratios are really good for that. You can that, ratio down the deflection and the moment because they're linear. So whatever the trip width is. So yeah, that's that's the other thing. If you, we can just keep the model like this. We don't even need to increase that. Yeah. But then, with whatever deflection and moment you come up with for this jam, you can increase that by the ratio of the true trip width over what we yeah. what we model. Um, so that's another way that okay, we don't need to model several different things. We can. Can I ask you too, Matt? On this one, let's say what you're talking about, the jam is like 35 inches. Mm -hmm. It's like a few inches. Do you stress about a few inches? Or would you just model the typical one? Because that. Well, I guess what, what you, so, so like, that's 33. Is there any kind of a tolerance where if the jam's like a few inches bigger that you don't worry about it? So what much? I would look at, I'd run this model and look at the values we're coming up with. If we're right on. A couple inches isn't going to do a whole lot, but I would. I I may make the justification, but again, you have to have some rationale for it. I just said this. If I'm if you're sure at anything. like sixty or seventy percent capacity on deflection and stress, just say by observation, you know that it's going to be a couple inches isn't going to kick us over. So again, this is a simple way to take a something that looks very complicated and take it down into something that's really manageable. All right, next item, uh, clearly label numbers in ways that make sense and are easy to follow. And this is on uh, sheet three and four of the PDF. So if you look at these, the, the labels, um, the number labels. That you just lost video right there. Oh yeah, I know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so if you look at all of these, these are basically just the standard default uh, member uh, <coughs> callouts uh, that Rhesus puts on. Now, if you look at the verticals and you're doing an analysis, does anybody see any order to this at all? That that if I'd say, okay, we need to look at M25, and, and you're reviewing this, and you find an M25 sheet in the calcs, all right, how are you gonna find this easily um, on a model like this? And something like this, this is a smaller model, but if we have bigger models, it can be very tedious to find, um, not only when you're reviewing, but if you need to go back months or a year down the line for your own calcs and try to figure this out, it's going to be tough. Um, so this is, again, this is how I do things. Um, I always label my verticals left to right. Um, so in a case here, JVM, Jam Vertical Mullion, one is going to be is what I have for this whole um, thing right here. And then I split it up into the section. And verticals go the same way. VM1, vertical mullion 1, vertical mullion 2, 3, and jam 2. That way, if you say, uh, okay, where's uh, vertical mullion 3 3, I know that it's the third mullion over 3 up. Um, so I know that other people have different ways of labeling things, um, but try to find some way that works for you um, that's easy to reference. Um, and that's not just a whole bunch of random. random Is it difficult to relabel <coughs> that in Teresa? Now that may be a question for Ryan because I always I'm I'm quick at it, so I right. do it just type in everything. There I may be a quicker way. This. So if you go up to tools, there is those options to relabel joints and members. But if you use those, Risa basically just goes through and does one through whatever. In the order that you put it in. Yeah, yeah it's going to look like what you printed out if you go and redo that. It's just going to renumber it. Right. So what I'll do with some of these, um, I won't go through and relabel them like Matt will, but on the printed set, like what he's got in the handout, I will highlight over the name of the member I'm checking 
so it's in yellow or green or some bright color so it's really easy to pick out where on the model it's actually at. So you're not necessarily going through and relabeling it based on where it's at on the frame like Matt does, but it's still very easy to find when somebody's reviewing and looking for it. Yeah, and again, something like that, I've seen other people do stuff like that. As long as it's clear and easy to follow, um, do you just relabel by clicking on it, double clicking on it? And, I'll and go in, type it. Go in. If right. you go to the spreadsheet, yeah. if you go to the spreadsheet though, can't you create a list on like Excel that you can easily just drag down and the numbers increase and then paste them there? Or you I guess you type could, it but if you're doing, yeah, I guess it depends on how you actually. Like for the horizontals, yeah, could you do that? You could, but there may not be any kind of order to where it is on the model. That does not just go like bottom up. Yeah. It depends so on you how have, you drew it. You have to be careful that you're not. Oh, yeah, because, because yeah, yeah, if it's all yeah. an M, like mm -hmm. if you sort it, it's. So yeah, if, it's if you do like right. what Javier is saying, that H1 may be top right of the model and H2 yeah. may be in the middle. So it, or something. it's the exact same. Yeah. It might be worth it for like a model that you only have verticals that you know that it goes in a certain order to do uh, V1, V2, V3 and just write it down in Excel, copy and paste it. Yeah, yeah. Now, one good thing about this, while we have it open, that helps me go faster is you know how for horizontals you have to do one that's fully um, released and one that's just released for bending. If you go to the advanced tab, it, when you draw the member, you can put them all as just both pinned, and then go back, highlight the whole entire section, and just fill with all pinned or you know whatever you want to do. And it really, so, to me, that helps go really fast on those. So what what you're talking about? This also gets into why I label these. So I'll go through, do all that. Once I have all my horizontals labeled, I'll go in on this one, set my end releases. Go into your advance, sort, and then so the first horizontal <coughs> will have these filled in, mm -hmm. and then I'll just copy everything down. Uh, okay, I'm I'm not, too, I'm say, what I'm saying is like go to draw a member, like go to like where you're drawing a branded member. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. I know what you're talking. Yeah, you can you, select you're that. So the, you're, you're sending them both as pinned. Yeah, I know that that's then, the, that I can do. That's that. what I do. I just never do it. Oh, okay. Have you ever used the selection tool that's in there? No. Wait, the selection so, tool. Click on the little question mark, second, third from the bottom over on the left. You can highlight different Wait, members where? and make the left sidebar. It's the third from the bottom. Is that question mark? Yeah, oh, this. So this allows you to select members based on name, member type, all that stuff. Go to that member tab. So up from, uh, where's it at? There's a way to select based on name. So I think that from box, if you type in just HM and hit apply, it should select all your horizontals. Oh, that's nice. So then you can yeah. apply your releases using that too. Why haven't you told us about this stuff? Yeah. No, I told us about This is stuff that I've never <laughs> even, yeah. This is a lot of fun. He can show you, trust me, he can show you how to do that 8,000 times to go do it yourself, and it doesn't work. Yeah. One, that's one why I'm just like, trust I, I'm me. sticking yeah. with what I. Well, one good thing about labeling too is that when you click on the results tab, like on the analysis tab where it shows you the moment and the right. picture. The label that you use is clearly displayed on the on the header of that printout. Oh, so yeah. If you run your analysis and then click on the, so you could highlight it on your on, on your big model there, or when you click that, that's right. you have you have yep. it right there. Right that's there. another. That's that's another plus of uh, of labeling. You can see exactly what you're doing. Right? So I have a question on how you do it. One of the things I struggle with most in Risa is printouts. Because I never get the scale right to where it's legible for, it's either way too small or it's way too big. And right. How do you play around? Do you just, literally, you're just playing around with it until you get one that looks decent? Yeah, usually I use like 1.5, or yeah, it's set at 1.5 and everything's legible. Okay. That's something, yeah, whenever, 
Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's on these yeah. bigger ones like this. Sometimes you might have to bump it to two, two and a half. I've had to use three sometimes on really big frames. So yeah. It all just it, you really just need to kind print of one, see what it looks like until you get to a point that it works, and then just run with it. Okay, so I'm doing it right. Just yeah. There's, there's I'm not, not good at really selecting what looks good. There's like a better way to do that. Third try. Okay. It'd be helpful if we could just say we're printing to 11 by 17 or 8.5 by 11 mm. scale to fit page and look decent. Come cool. on, Risa. Um, okay, any other questions uh, for that? Are you going to touch on later on on what to print on the calculations? Like what what printouts just really really need to go there? Because yeah. I think that's an area where be talking about like do we need to look print out all the for all the numbers for jam or that? But also when you're putting together your cloud <coughs> package, what what do you need to show from your Risa model? Or like end releases or local access or I'm, moments. I'm like not touching on that simply because that's more of a Cal format. Yeah. Um, it's not so much an efficiency thing. Um, that's something that we can talk about maybe in the future, like exactly what things need to be printed out. Um, um, okay, uh, next item, modeling those typical horizontal, or modeling typical horizontal mullions, uh, head, intermediate, and sill. Um, I'm not sure if people do this, um, but if you look at sheet five of the printout, here's the same elevation, basically, with all the, the proper extrusions, um, particularly for the horizontals. Um, uh, in place. So for your horizontals, you actually have four different horizontals on here. Now, that's going to take additional time to make sure, especially for the, the head and sill members where we don't typically get section properties, you're going to need to go through, find those, make sure that every member is uh, the proper section, um, which again, it may not take a whole lot of time, but it's taking some additional time on this. Um, what we really can so here you can see I basically have all the horizontals the same. Um, the reason for this is because these, the actual section properties of these horizontals, um, especially since they're released at the ends, isn't having a big impact um, on the vertical uh, member analysis. So. And there is an exception if we're modeling something where the horizontals, we're actually looking at them and doing an analysis, then we need to model those correctly and put the correct section properties in. Uh, but for a case like this, where this model is primarily for analysis of vertical members, I wouldn't waste my time going and putting in all the correct um, uh, horizontal sections. Questions on that? Really, and to add on what you're saying, really the only other time that you would need a reason model for a horizontal member is when you're taking a look at door headers to for the deflection of door headers and how they're loaded. In that case, uh, so sometimes our clients like to have three or four, maybe five stacks of DLO stacked on top of an opening. And uh, that's when we need to really make sure that that door header is not over deflecting or or the door won't open. And that's, a, that's a big problem. Yep. Or that one, yeah, sorry. Just to cut on, the one you have in the model is kind of a, a unique deal. This right here? That, yeah. Yeah, so this is, a, this is another case. Um, if you're going to use this model to, to actually look at this horizontal, since we have another vertical tying into it, um, again, you can leave all the other horizontals as is, but make sure that this member right here um, is actually the correct member that we're, we're analyzing. Page dead load on horizontals. Uh, how many glass sizes? So uh, if we go to sheet six, I've seen a lot of people doing it this way. There's nothing wrong with it. It just is more time consuming. Um, so if you look at sheet six, um, you can see this is basically all the point loads representative of the glass weight 
on the two setting blocks uh, that they sit in. Now, this along with Enresa specifying um, a negative gravity load, which would take care of your the weight of the frame. <coughs> This is that that this is a correct way to do it. The thing is, for a simple model like this, where we're looking at verticals, there's no need to do it this way. Um, what you can do is basically just have your your linear loads based on tributary width of your verticals, and apply those uh, to your verticals. Um, that's going to give you axial loading that you need. Um, again, you don't have to, especially where we have elevations with numerous uh, glass sizes. And I know that we have spreadsheets that we can input things, but that does, that can take a lot of time. Um, so modeling your dead load like this, um, very simple to do. Now in a case where, let's say you have this door header and you have a, um, a vertical right above it. That may be an instance where you don't want to use the linear load because then you're having a very high concentrated um, point load right at your horizontal, which even if you're putting if you're putting your, your point loads on the horizontals, you're still going to get that load transfer into your vertical and there will be a point load down here. But when we use point loads in a case like that, it's going to be a more accurate, um, accurate model and can help us out with reflection um, at the time of the model. Just be careful to add the steel weight when you do that. Yeah, so if in a case like this, um, that's another thing. I'll have my, my dead load, which is, is just the weight of the frame and the glass. <laughs> if I have steel um, reinforcing anywhere in here, I'll have another line for dead load of steel and then put the linear load right where the steel is for the weight uh, of the steel itself. Can I add one more? Yep. Um, like as an even easier way to put those linear loads on that I started doing, <coughs> if you put it on with the same way you do your wind in the Y direction and then you force it to do A, B distribution, it actually, it ends up all as a lin the exact same linear load. Does it, um, have you compared the two? Does yeah, they're the exact same. Okay. So then you that's a the that's end. another yeah. way. Um, so yeah, do uh, negative six and a half, and then change that distribution to AB. And then if you, you put it on, yeah, the from the bottom left and go around. Oh, it was you had to go to the sorry. I usually. Bottom left, then bottom right. That way? Yeah, that way. Just gotta do it the other way. And then I do it the other way. You just <laughs> That's how to, I've always. You just have to change your. Yeah, so there we go. So then now that just puts that load on your vertical. So it's an in plane. Mm -hmm. Oh, so you input as a, a PSS, it was an area load, but just on the vertical? Yeah, so when you do that A B distribution, it only applies it to your vertical members. Now the one thing, I think another reason why I don't typically do that, if you have a case where you have any type of sloped glazing, that's, it's not gonna be correct because if you have your glazing this way with a load that way, it's going to, it's gonna force everything. Won't be, or, a, true, or, or, won't be a true dead load, it'll be it, in a plane. Yeah, and load. even if you do an area load facing That's in the Y direction, mm -hmm. it's going to load the glass in plane. Or maybe I'm talking about it's, 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 it's not gonna it's not gonna yeah. load it so based it's, accurately. This, this can only be used for rectangular frames that are completely vertical. Right. You have to be very careful about the layout. Because Risa can do very weird things with this if there's yeah. different geometries in the frame because it's making a lot of assumptions on how it distributes that to those verticals. Well the other thing, it's not only distributing to the the verticals, 
it's distributing to the, all the horizontals as well. You, this using this, this, a, this AB setup does not. It's a one-way load, so okay. it's only going left and right. But that's that's another thing you've got to be careful about, how Matt told you to go counterclockwise when you're drawing it. If you go the other way, using AB is not the correct set. You've got to pick one of the other, like, VCs or yeah. to make sure it matches the way. So, okay, so, so in essence, if you're using this, you need to be very careful on Yeah. Double yeah, check your loads, yeah. make sure it's actually but, distributing. But you need to idiot check yourself and just run a DL yes. low load case and see how it's distributing it through your um, whatever those, what I'm trying to say. Once you and run it. drop down your transient loads or whatever. Yeah, just check your transient. And then it'll show if it's just vertical or just horizontal. Will it load the uh, horizontals if they're uh, not selected or in in inactive? Yes. Yeah. If they're drawn in, they're actual members, if you set that to like a two-way load accidentally, it will load the horizontals. Mm -hmm. So then the other thing about this, um, go up to settings and go to global. Uh, go to the uh, solution tab. So that area load mesh, mm -hmm. that defaults to one square foot. So if you're doing this area load and you've got weird DLO sizes that don't break down to just one foot increments, Reese is going to make some assumptions about how to split that load up, and it's not going to match your hand counts. So I would so, say, I would say for the new guys, don't, don't do it this way. Yeah. Um, <laughs> at least for right now. Until, uh, until you've got a good grasp of what Reese is actually doing with those area loads, yeah. Because that's actually another thing, and now that now that you're bringing this up, I've never, I've always assumed that it's being applied correctly. And now that I know that there's the A, B, and the direction, yeah, well, that's you just some line there. If it's a horizontal line, that just tells you it's going near vertical. That's what how the A, B. So like, change that dead. Sorry, I don't want to get into a thing, but change the dead load to like B, C if you want, um, and you're what can we call it? Can I do that? Just right mm -hmm. from here. Yeah, go to that area load. So change your distribution to like BC. Then vertical path. And now it's vertical line vertical. So now it's only applying to your horizontal. Like mm. what? R Wasn't run your analysis real uh, fast. In the middle of the thing. The big uh, arrow. Well, I guess we should. Oh, okay. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. That just tells you it's going out to your vertical. If you, if you would run it without the one load. Yeah. And then did it and looked at how the distribution of the load is going, you would see horizontal distribution now versus <coughs> pure vertical. But yeah, I don't know. It, I hate putting little hand calcs in my PDFs if I don't have to, so that makes it so that you can just. Here's, here's one other um, thing that I've actually started doing um, because. And this is again something that it's conservative, but if it works, I have no issues with it. This max um, uh, linear load for the intermediates, I'll also throw those on jams because I know that if the, that if that that axial load, if the jams work, or if the intermediates work, the jams are the same member. It's just conservative. It's easy to do. It's not impacting anything. It's not impacting anchors. Um, so that's another way that I can just throw a linear, just a constant linear load on all of them. Um, okay. Item number six. Um, this is getting into something similar to what I was just saying about being conservative. Uh, if feasible, be conservative unless that leads to additional challenges or steel reinforcing. Um, so what I'll do, good majority of the time for a frame like this, I'll go ahead and run it, and I'm I'm gonna pick and choose what vertical or what what verticals that I look at and what values I can put into Risa, or into our spreadsheets. So if you look at sheet seven, so I guess it's the very last sheet in the print off. Um, the first three sheets there, I've highlighted the, the maximum moment, or maximum axial load, 
and then your area with your maximum deflection. Now what I'll do, if you look at the second to last sheet, I'm taking those three values, the highest three values for the entire elevation, and combining them into one analysis. Now it's true that one specific vertical is not going to see those three occurrences, but if one vertical can withstand the max of all three, everything is good. Um, so you don't need to, I wouldn't need to do a check for um, this member, uh, VM3-1, which has the maximum axial, but a lower moment, and then check 3-4, which has basically no axial and a higher moment, why go through checking numerous verticals like that when you can combine it all into one? Um, so that's what I did on that second to last sheet, and basically it's a coverall um, conservative uh, way of looking at it. Another way to do it, uh, Matt does this a lot, the last sheet is basically just throw in arbitrary maximum moments or uh, maximum axial loads to determine um, what values the, the moment in question, in question can take. So on that last sheet, um, for this particular vertical, again, looking at just an arbitrary 1,500 pound axial load, um, you can have a maximum uh, uh, 300, or 3,500 foot-pounds um, of moments and still call the volume good. So if you do a check sheet like this, then you can print out the, the detail sheets on your model. Just make a note, okay, um, based on this analysis sheet. So what I've done uh, with that, it's kind of like using a control sheet. Say, okay, you're using Mullion WW500. Yep. Or yep. Have a control sheet at the beginning of your recent models and look at the, at the allow, total allowable moment there, the, the, the one that's calculated by the sheet, the 3,821, and use that kind of as a guideline to see if you'll need reinforcement or something. And if you don't need reinforcement anywhere and you're fine with, and your maximum moment is, is well below that one or, or below that one. Make sure you, on that sheet you're putting your maximum arm raise strength, like, like Matt's saying here. And, uh, and then, then you don't really need to be forcing a value on to, onto that set. What are you, so if you're using your maximum moment, what are you doing about axial? For that, yes, I would add an actual load based on whatever you're getting at the moment to see that. Okay, so it's, it, it's, about, it, it's, yeah, it's something same similar same. Yeah. To, to that. Um, on the summary sheets, though, sometimes what I do is I just use that moment, that MN, mm -hmm. uh, and, and you know how we have that cell. Yeah. I would make sure, especially for open shapes, that I use a maximum umbrage length and the yep. moment that comes from it and use it on the summary sheets. So and on the summary sheet, it very quickly flags if it's okay on reinforcement or a moment. Mm -hmm. But that's something a bit different from like a recent model. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing, like you were mentioning, I made note that I'm actually conservatively using the maximum umbrace length on the entire elevation, along with your smallest span, uh, because first off, the smallest span is going to give you your smallest allowable uh, deflection, and then your maximum umbrace length, it's going to give you the weakest um, uh, the moment that you can take. So it's all a conservative design. Now, I only use this if it's not causing me to add additional steel or make modifications. If you have to make modifications, then don't be so uh, conservative. Um, start looking at, at more detailed, uh, detailed checks on it. Uh, one, one of the notes that I would like to make on that, whenever you're using a sheet to kind of set up a, uh, a max or a framework where you know that it's going to be the maximum. Look down at the unity. Uh, the unity on this is 1, 1 1.0. Don't let that unity go up to 1.04 on something that you're going to use as a max. Just just use the unity of 1. Okay? 
for something where we use a framework to you know classify our, our members. When just to kind of build on what Stuart's saying, when you're doing that using maximums or like Javier is saying, you're mixing lengths with maximum embrace that may not be on the drawings, make sure you're noting that that's what you're doing for like you your mat when we're checking it so we know that's what's going on and it doesn't look like a mistake. Because I've run across that before where I'm checking the project and it looks like you're mixing stuff when you didn't intend to do that. Okay, um, item seven, compare members where possible. Uh, I kind of touched on this before. Uh, this is reducing uh, redundancies in your analysis. So if I'm looking at uh, vertical mullion three, um, it's the exact same mullion as your jam. Everything checks out stress-wise. Um, in this case, your jam, we have a three-quarter inch ceiling joint, so your allowable movement's 0.84. Clearly, since the, the member's the same, it checks out stress-wise for your typical. You know that the jam's gonna be the same, that it's gonna be fine. Since your vertical, your intermediate vertical deflection is under the allowable for your jam, again, you know that your jam's fine. So just based on this analysis, you don't need to do anything with the jam. But do make a note in the analysis for this vertical that the jam's okay by comparison um, based on three quarter inch ceiling joint. So again, that just eliminates unnecessary, unnecessary um, the other way to do that, and we talked about it, that if, if for some reason um, if there's a condition where, let's say, you're modeling this elevation it's, and it's all in a typical zone, you have a jam condition that falls in a corner zone, you don't necessarily need to model that in a corner zone. You can, so in this case, if we have, here's our deflection, uh, 0.32. If we have another jam that's in a corner zone, we don't want to model that. We can bump up this deflection by a ratio of the uh, corner wind zone pressure to the typical. So essentially, since it's, it's uh, you can, you're essentially factoring up your, um, your deflection for that corner zone. Same thing with your, your moment, you can factor that up based on either the ratio of your wind pressures or ratio of your trip widths. Um, if you need. Uh, okay. Questions on that? And then the uh, final item on here is basically keep your models as simple as possible. Don't add more stuff um, than you actually need. Don't model more members than you actually need. Um, this was a model, this was several years back. Uh, it's, it's fairly complex. <laughs> um, what's going on here? So it's basically sloped curtain wall and these Areas out here, these are sun shades that are sticking and projecting off of the curtain wall. Now, a couple things on this. If we're going back to labeling um, members somehow, with the sun shades added to the model, it gets very, there's a lot going on in keeping track of um, members or even, even making sure that that releases are correct, loads are correct. Um, there's a lot of, of room in here where you can have, uh, have errors. So what I would recommend on something like this, again, the curtain wall itself, it's sloped, it's corners. I would still model the entire curtain wall. What I would do though, um, if possible, model the sunshades in a separate file um, so that you're just isolated your sunshades and then once we have those loads, go back, apply those to your curve wall frame um, in whatever load combinations are necessary. Um, doing that will make things a lot easier to review, a lot easier for you to go through, find different things on the model. Um,
and especially again, you have to go back in the future. Um, it'll make things a lot easier for you. So wherever you can minimize the number of members um, or complexity of the model, it's going to help you out. One thing I find challenging when when bringing loads from a from another model, which I've I've, I've proven myself that it, it's nine out of ten times it, it makes more sense doing it like right. what yeah. you're saying. Watch out to, I mean, I guess the question is, what's your best way of not being overly conservative and loading full snow with full wind? Because that's some, that, sometimes that is, is oh. overly conservative. So you have to be careful that you're not either like reducing you to, it too much by a. By you have to make factor. sure that, so if I'm just looking at the sun shades, I'll have, I'll have all the, the proper load cases specified in here. Um, and then that's kind of a thing where I'll go through and like the first load case dead load, I'll just start eliminating some of these because I know that that's not going to control at all. Um, so that's the first uh, area that I'll start, just start eliminating some load cases that I know aren't, um, aren't, aren't going to be used. Um, and then I guess with that's that's kind of a project by project thing that I just need to kind of look at it and see see how not to do that. Basically, I'll a lot of the times I'll take the the reactions for a given load case mm -hmm. from the sunshade. I'll still have all the load cases for the curtain wall, but then just put in those loads for that given the, the maximums of the of the sunshade. Yeah, so if it's, if it's a case where you have full snow load. Um, I mean, I guess you can reduce it on that table because I think there's a combination of 0.75 snow and 0.75. So, so, yeah, so like on nice. number three, um, if I put on the full snow load from the sunshade onto the curtain wall, I'll also reduce wind pressures on the curtain wall by whatever factors well, there on are. On that sheet, yeah. Um, so again, we're sticking with the, the load combinations yeah. and just reducing them where. Do what child load, if on your sunshade model, you already took out the reduction for wind on, on the wind updraft on that uh, sunshade. Mm -hmm. If we apply it again here, once we have, uh, if we're simply applying the reaction load from the sunshade, you need to be careful that you're not kind of like double, doubling that reduction. See what I'm saying? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So if in, in this, uh, so like here on the 0.75 snow, you want to make sure that, so we get a reaction for that. Yeah. When we put it on the model, you're saying don't reduce that by 0.75 but again. Yeah. So, so you just need you to be very careful. Snow you, on you, the yeah. sunshade model you're, and then you. Yeah, so, so any of the loads that you're getting from sunshade, those are, you're taking those, you're not modifying those at all when you're looking at the curve wall. Yeah. You would just be modifying the loads other than sunshade applying the yeah. curve wall. So Quick question yeah. about this, and I haven't had this happen on a project yet. There is that load combination where you have the 0.75 snow load and 0.75 wind load. When you have a, a corner situation where we're looking at the full pressure off of each face, and then the 75% on each face, is that 75% of the 75% of the wind load? Wait, you know what I'm talking about? Oh, 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 yeah. So we look at 75, the the unbalanced. Yeah. I've never ran into that situation, but is that something that we could potentially apply? I would think so. Couldn't we do that? Because if you have 75 positive, 75 negative, if you put in a, that, that would be your 100% win for that loading. Yeah. It's for the unbalance. It's yeah. yeah. for the unbalance load, so and it was still five. It's 100% so, so yeah. of the unbalance, if so you're too going, bad you apply the 75. Yeah, if you're going to put in 75% snow, 75% wind, you would reduce those again by 75%. Okay, I'm just curious because I've never ran into that situation. But because you also yeah. have the 100% wind without the unbalance reduction, yep. to which you do apply the 75% reduction. Yep. So in, in a model of sunshades, you know, that would be something like that, I would also reduce the complexity of 
if you have an individual model for the sunshades, there's a lot of ways to reduce the complexity with tributary areas yep. so that you, you know, get maximum loads for your sunshade and then you then you can actually back it into your model with actual tributary ratios. Matt, can you zoom in on a on a sunshade and turn on the load like the load K view? So yeah, select that one turn on the snow load. Yeah. But like Stuart was saying, those loads are linear. So they're they're gonna be um, if if it gets if that sunshade gets twice as long, your reaction point of the connection with the curtain load is gonna be twice as much, basically. You, so you can use that ratio of the sunshade dimension uh, to dump your loads into the curtain. Yeah, so and, and play with that ratio as you load your curtain wall. Yeah. So you can really simplify your sunshade models and then uh, use ratios of those loads that you have as an output to, to input into your, your curtain wall. And that simplifies a lot of the work that you have to do. Yeah. This was a monster of a project. <laughs> yeah, that was it. a heck of a project. Yeah, I, I absolutely hate it. But yeah. Is it also tapering? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, on yeah. all directions. <laughs> so it, it goes out like that. It has sunshades. It, it, it's in Seattle. It was in Washington State. So our snow loads were just ridiculously high. And, and you get pictures of it now. It's yeah. Nice. It nice looks nice, around. but it, it took me weeks to do it. Is it on a casino? No, it was like an office building. <laughs> this was one, and I mean, th this is a good example about how on, on, on something this complex, you need to be on top of it because even we were having issues with with the different end releases and that yeah. throwing torque into the system. Um, so yeah, anytime anytime we can simplify these models. Um, and this this, kind of this precise project actually taught me, like forced me to to see a, a frame. Okay, if you have a straight frame that doesn't do all these crazy things, a straight frame with a sunshade. Don't even think about trying to modeling the whole thing together with the sunshade. Just model your sunshade, dump the load, and be done with it. This was kind of a was an oddball, but it shows you how quickly you can over. The other thing with that, you're gonna if you're looking at um, if you have an outrigger and you're trying to find the deflection of that, it's gonna be off because because as your curtain wall bows out, then that's gonna deflect yeah. differently with it, and then you have to figure that out. Um, so, 